Welcome back to the All Turtles podcast, a show about the future of work, the future of health, and entrepreneurs building the future with tech like AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder of All Turtles. Today, I'm interviewing Ishmael Jelani. Ishmael's the co-founder and CEO of Scoodle. Scoodle is a UK-based learning platform that connects students with tutors. We're going to talk about how this pandemic has brought remote learning to the forefront of education and why Ishmael wants to help teachers achieve rock star status for the work they do. So I'm joined today by Ishmael Jelani, who's the co-founder and CEO of Scoodle, which is a UK-based learning platform that connects students with tutors. Ishmael, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How's, how's the situation out where you are? Are you in, in London somewhere or nearby? Yeah, um, as of today, London officially has, well, I say London, the UK has the most deaths in Europe. Um, oh, wow. So it's, it's a weird uh, state. I think um, being a small startup, we've probably been able to adjust, um, I'd say, better than most um, other companies. Um, and being in education in particular has, has, I think, advantaged us probably a little bit better than a lot of others as well. Geez, well, glad, uh, or hopefully you and your, uh, your people are staying safe out there. Likewise for you guys. So, so t- tell us about Scoodle. What, what does Scoodle do? Sure. Um, it's a platform aiming to create brands for educators um, at its core. Um, the way that it works is simple. Educators create profiles. Um, they then list content like answering questions or uh, very soon uploading videos. Um, and then if students and parents like what they see, they can book lessons uh, with these teachers. Um, the idea, and I, I frame this um, in most of my conversations, we want to create the Kim Kardashians of the education world. Like you want educators to be. That's what I was going to, this is, this is interesting. <laughs> not the direction I was expecting. Uh, <laughs> that that uh, influencer education platform. Exactly. Like they deserve to be famous and they deserve to be recognized and they deserve to be multi-millionaires. Um, and it's being able to create a platform that can facilitate exactly that. And I think now more than ever, we're starting to realize how critical they are to our existence as a society. So um, we're hoping Scoodle can can play a huge part in making that possible. Is that, is that a core differentiator for you guys? Because there's lots of different ways to learn things online. All Turtles works with a company called Chatterbox that you might be aware of. Yeah. That uh, has, a, has a, a, a different mission, but, you know, a similar premise. That we're connecting people that want to learn things with people who want to teach things um, in a marketplace. So how do you, is, is the... Is the influencer angle is is that your your hook for this product? It's exactly it's exactly that. Um, we are a lot less focused uh, on the organization's recognition. Of course, we want Scoodle to become a household right. name, but the path to achieving that isn't by plastering our names everywhere. It's actually by getting the educators recognized. So we spend most of our SEO work indexing the answers that teachers are answering or indexing their full names and things like that. Um, Even in terms of business model, we're the first in our marketplace that I've seen, at least, that doesn't charge uh, commission on bookings. So whatever an educator charges, they get to keep everything uh, because we want them to stay to continue to create content uh, that adds value to students and parents. I think the, the best comparison that I can think of is, you know, when you think of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford, all the, the best institutions, or even the, the big ed tech companies like Khan Academy or Coursera. These are names that I can list because I recognize the organizations, but I can't name more than five people at any one of those organizations right. or institutions because they weren't the ones that got the recognition. And that's exactly what we wanted to turn around. It's the educator. They are at the heart of the success of education, not the institutions. So fundamentally, how are you connecting the learners with the teachers? The first point of discovery tends to be content. So it's really mm-hmm. the case that students would find out about us by searching math tutor. Um, what would usually happen is they type in a question on Google and they come across Guru and the, the person who's answered that question. Um, and then they can discover other types of content that that teacher has put up there. So other answers and learning resources and uh, kind of our core metric for uh, for our tutors and our educators is students help. So we 
put all of these uh, discovery points together to put that number onto their profile. Um, and if a student and parent kind of really likes what they see from a teacher, they can then message them directly and arrange a lesson where uh, obviously we don't charge any of the commission. Um, and we're also going to introduce new ways for educators to make money. So a kind of royalty-based system on some of the content. And there are other avenues that we plan to expand our educator focus. But step one is, uh, can we get them discovered through the questions that they've answered? Um, and the answer seems to be yes. Uh, so now step two is, how many other types of content can we get them to list onto their profile? Because they are all very valuable. Who's using this? Like, what's the age range? What's What are, what are the skills people are looking to learn or the subjects or you know the coursework like what, what's what's the most common it, it tends to be students aged 13 to 18 um in the uk the two main exams are called the gcses and the a level it's kind of the, the pre-university prep and the educators tend to be a combination of current university students from undergrad to uh, kind of phd level um i think what's interesting in terms of what we've seen uh, specifically with the timing that we're at now um, we're seeing significantly more educators join our platform because there are, you know, master students that would work at bars or cafes that can't do that anymore. Um, and so the prospect of working on Scoodoo and sharing knowledge is actually way more exciting now than it's ever been before. That's what I was going to ask next. Is has the either both the very top of the funnel, the discovery, and the usage patterns within the product has has that changed in the last couple of months with uh, with everyone sheltering. Everything has gone up. Like every metric that we track has gone up um, in terms of uh, monthly active users. For example, between March compared to the February it went up fifty three percent. Our revenue uh, in April was three times higher than it was in March, which was about forty percent higher than it was the month before, um, which is is strange because it wasn't a, as a result of an uptick in marketing spend necessarily on our side. It's There is a kind of sudden demand for our products and services. And I think, interestingly enough, when it comes to marketing, uh, because everybody is spending a lot less uh, where cuts are being made, the outcome of that is when we do start spending on kind of Facebook or Google ads or you know even working with influencers, generally everything is actually cheaper cost per imp- uh, per thousand impressions is lower than what it was before so right. everything is kind of falling into this place where everybody wants to really learn right now online and that hasn't been there before it's cheaper to reach people compared to what it's been before um, and put the two together it's okay we really need to uh, do everything that we can to make the most of this growth and to push the company as far as we can those are uniquely favorable conditions for a particular segment <laughs> of, yeah, of product um, right it's, now. It, it's one of those things where it's we couldn't have made this happen. We would never have wanted to have made something like this happen. But um, when it comes to, you know, even investor conversations, one of the most challenging questions to answer, I think, is the why now question, because right. you can't control macroeconomic conditions. Now could be a very bad time for you to exist as a company and there's nothing you could do about it. We're just fortunate enough to be in a position where uh, it's it's the opposite for us. Now is probably the best time to exist in our space, but it's not because of things that we were in control of. I, I, I like that you invoke the why now uh, <laughs> you know, framework for talking to investors. But what about what about the why you like what, what's is there a personal story? to this? A a little bit. Um, When I was at university, um, I started my first business in teaching to pay for my undergrad, actually. Um, I would teach uh, small classes in economics. Initially, it was actually one-to-one tutoring. Didn't quite add up to what a university degree costs. Um, So I would get my (laughs) students to refer other students to uh, join my class. And it worked out really well. I think in just over a year, uh, I made enough to cover the cost of uh, my entire degree. And that was kind of the seed of getting into the world of education, one of the biggest insights for me was looking at how difficult the first class was to set up and how easy the last 10, 15, 20 classes were to set up. And the big difference between the two was class number one, nobody knew who I was. Class number 20, I was the economics guy in North London. Like it it was pretty easy easy to have people sign up to my class. And it's that idea that I think uh, set up this foundation of educator brands. They already exist on a micro level. 
everybody knows the popular teachers in their local schools and everybody wants them to teach their kids. That's already there. We would just want to amplify right. that to a global level where, you know, the amazing teachers in Egypt can be recognized in the, in the States and in London and in Hong Kong and everywhere in between as well. Is Scoodle, is it only one-to-one private tutoring or are you exploring, you know, more one-to-many options just g- given the way students are learning right now? Yeah, um, we started off one-to-one um, just as a focused go-to-market strategy. It's something that we kind of understood pretty well. Uh, the immediate next steps is to facilitate one-to-many via video rather than in person for obvious reasons. It's uh market conditions dictate that um but also i think one thing that on a a kind of a philosophical level i think we want to facilitate knowledge in such a way that it can be repurposed and reused by millions of students all around the world and you you lose that um when the lesson takes place live in person to one other student i mean it's it's great for that student's uh learning but you can't then share that knowledge, that, the actual teaching. Um, and doing online video classes allows us to facilitate exactly that, which is the idea that you've taught something, but you could also record that same thing and allow others to discover and to learn directly from you. Let's, let's dive a little bit into so like some of the details of the product and, and the sure. uh, exchange between uh, educators and students. Um, I mean, in, in the current state in learning, even in a place like I live in San Francisco and there's public schools here. The private schools are fantastically expensive, <laughs> uh, you know, as, as much as my uh, university degree, even for very small aged, small school children. So the, the value is, is questionable. You know, you're unsure what's happening at these places and it's extremely expensive and you're unsure of the attention that the students are, are getting. How does that compare to Scoodle? Like how how expensive is it to use Scoodle? And is this a potential, you know, replacement for a more consistent curriculum? Or is this only like focused tutoring? Like, you know, let's make sure we pass this particular test or this particular subject. You've touched base towards our, you know, 10 year mission of the world that we want to create. And it's the idea that we exist alongside uh, existing school structures. Um, the idea that you know a kid and their parent would say that, you know what, we're not going to go to school today. We're going to school it today. Um, and it's being able to create that level of flexibility. Um, and the quality of teaching is one variable to consider. And obviously, so is uh, is cost. Right now, um, the fact that we don't charge a uh, commission on lessons allows us to reduce costs um, a little bit more than uh, most others would do. Uh, one-to-one teaching is obviously still uh, more expensive than the class structure, which is why we're going for that as our next step. And the, the idea it's, I, I know startups use the notion of democratizing things all the time, but the idea that if we're able to bring the costs down to such a level that it's actually accessible to everybody everywhere. That becomes a very powerful thing um, where the only constraint now becomes internet access. Uh, and, and for me, it, it's not just about um, you know, low-income students accessing high-quality teachers. It's also high-quality teachers that aren't currently recognized being able to distribute their teaching methods to people all around the world because you do find that there are incredible teachers that are just unknown in places like Kenya or South Africa or Malaysia. Um, And facilitating that connection allows us to make education accessible in a way that it hasn't really been done before. And that done at scale is what loops back into this idea that, you know, I'm going to school today. (laughs) I'm not going to go to school. That's the world that we want to create. Are are the most popular tutors generally uk or western europe based or are they all over the place right now it's uk mainly because of uh go to market focus and our intention to execute really well here again the the biggest kind of contributing factor towards internationalization is um is video which is why we're doing we're focusing on that at least um for our next product cycle and um, all of our marketing efforts are now going to shift towards um, allowing people to access teachers online. I wonder if we should talk a little bit just about the future of education broadly. You know, now that schools schools canceled <laughs> for the year, you know, across the board, at least in the United States, and at least in-person school. 
And I, th- I think, you know, th- this extends to older students as well and the uncertainties in the financial commitment uh, to university. Have, have you, my, I guess my question is, have you observed, leading into building this product, did you observe some particularly strong shifts in the ways people were learning that, um, that you felt that there was just an, a, a desperate need for something like this? I think one of the biggest uh, surprises was the extent to which supplementary learning had become a core part of the learning experience. What I mean by that is kids aren't just going to school to learn and then stopping there. There is always something else happening. And what's unfortunate, I think, is there's now kind of a discrepancy on who can access the best forms of education. Price does uh, go on to become a a barrier. Um, and at least at the early days of school, kind of pre pre-COVID, these types of learnings usually took place in person because online still had a barrier. It was more of a luxury uh, that people kind of chose to go for rather than preferring uh, to go for. Um, I think one of the biggest shifts that I'd seen since uh, COVID-19 has become a thing is the shift from online learning being a luxury to a necessity. Like that has now become an essential part of life. Um, And not just in terms of things like tutoring, but also the very institutions that you mentioned, universities are shut in person and nobody knows for how long. So institutions that were once told that, you know, you really should catch up onto this online thing, they would drag their feet. And now in the space of weeks, they're spending millions of dollars trying to catch up and facilitate, you know, uh, lecture recordings and lecture captures and things like that. That wasn't there before the urgency wasn't there the conversations had taken place you know the meetings were were there but people didn't quite care enough to make it part of the university experience and now that's become an essential part of being an institution facilitating education Um, so i think moving forward because we don't actually know what the next six months holds for for any of the the schools that have that have shut it's going to be very interesting to see how they facilitate learning with the unknown that's there, um, which is why we're expecting to see more and more schools, more and more institutions uh, going through the online platform. We're actually getting interest, for example, from uh, schools in China. Um, it was a very interesting insight where um, the, the coronavirus over there spread just after the Chinese New Year. So a lot of the foreign teachers that would work over there had gone back home. And they couldn't get back into China, but the school still needed to continue teaching. Um, and so all of a sudden, there's a huge shift in the demand of educators. And most of that demand has gone online. So uh, we expect to see institutions doing everything they can to create a world that is driven by online learning, arguably more so than the in-person experience. You know, I, I almost wonder, like, I'm, I'm thinking back to this, uh, you know, the conditions that you and, and your segment of companies and competitors are currently in, where it's kind of cheaper than ever to do uh, online right now, just CPMs are down. But the activity for this particular thing is, is probably way, way up. And I wonder, do you kind of just have to get lucky <laughs> that, that you're building something that like that fits into such a macro, you know, societal and economic shift? Or is there some intention along the way, like, hey, learning's going online, let's let's carve out a space? I think everybody that has chosen to build in this space has always had the vision and the expectation that the world will catch up. You know, of course, right. online learning is great. That was always there. I don't think anybody could have predicted how it ended up actually happening uh, because it was sudden, it was abrupt. And in literally one to two months, the thing that we would have expected to have taken years had all happened right away globally. It wasn't, you know, one corner of the world only testing something out. The whole world changed um, in these few months. I think that part, uh, I, I wish we could have foreseen something like that. There's no way we could have, we could have said that. Um, all we had was the certainty that the vision and the world that we're trying to create has to happen. We want to be a part of that and we see it going in that direction. And we were just very fortunate in that there was a silver lining from the experiences that we're having right now, uh, which is 
the demand has actually come far sooner than we would have expected, at least, uh, at least at this scale. How's the pandemic impacted your team and the ways you guys are working? Um, so we went kind of all work from home uh, pretty early on. So it's been maybe two months. Um, it was interesting because it's actually a lot better than I thought it would have been. Um, certain things that I didn't think we could have done online as well has been pretty straightforward. You know, product sessions where you have to whiteboard things and throw around ideas. That was a very in-person experience. Um, not, not as much anymore. It's pretty good in Figma. It's great to do it online. Like we, we prepare the notes in advance. Everybody has something that they can go back to. It works. And even the idea of, you know, virtual meeting rooms, they tend to work quite well. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what the demand is for things like co-working spaces uh, for startups of our size. Well, I, I was just wondering in your case in particular and your team, that the pandemic's impacting your work style for the positive as it relates to your product thinking. And, you know, this this next cycle, whenever you get things fully online or this like one to many uh, features or functionality, you know, if, if you'll be doing kind of a bit of dog fooding by by necessity. Quite possibly. Um, I, I don't know how how much or how many of the things that we used to do will go back to doing. I mean, <laughs> if I right. just think about burn, uh, office space is not cheap. It's quite expensive. We would end up requiring that our hires are you know, within an hour distance or so of, of the office space, maybe an hour and a half at most. But working from home has given us access to a much wider talent pool. It saves us money because we don't spend on office space as much. I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. Um, my team may probably fight me after this saying like, hey, we haven't thought uh, thought about this yet. But it's very possible that um, we, we may not go back to the in-person experiences in the way that we had before, because it is working far better than we thought it would. Um, and we'd likely end up with some type of mix where, you know, there is some elements of working in person, but we're so much more comfortable with working from home, I think, than we've been before. Oh, yeah, we're, we're finding ourselves in the exact same boat. and. And talking through all the ways we can use that investment in office space in San Francisco, which is extremely expensive, and make it a bit more atomized or a bit more event based. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. So, do you have any advice for students or parents that are listening right now in how they can do distance learning most effectively? Besides, check out Scoodle. Ah, uh, you got there. You got there before I could. <laughs> <laughs> When it comes to students and parents, uh, I think word of mouth is still a very powerful thing. You're going to get recommendations from other parents of tutors and educators that they found very helpful. Uh, and I can understand that there may still be a little bit of a barrier when it comes to online learning, um, but it's it's worth taking the leap uh, because you'd be very surprised by how well it could work. And speaking also to the educators that um, happen to be listening, um, your brand is the most powerful thing I think you have. You have something that nobody else has. Uh, so platforms like Scoodle or, or YouTube or even LinkedIn are there to help you voice your existence as an educator. Um, so I would recommend not just signing up to places that let you teach, but actually putting out content to start creating your brand's as educators, because the world needs you now more than ever. I, I love that message. I love that. I, I hope that shift occurs that, uh, you know, educators are revered for their individual characteristics over the, the, uh, the emblem on the university wall. So given just the, the status of the online education industry right now, I imagine uh, everything is just popping. Like, the time on site or the ways people are trying to discover you or, and we already talked about this, the, the lower expense for, for doing direct marketing. What's going on with the company? Are you guys raising right now? Are you, are, are you talking to <laughs> investors? We, we didn't want to. Um, our plan was to raise in eight or nine months time. Um, we have enough cash in the bank to, you know, last the recession and its recovery as well. But what we're starting to see is more and more investors are actually reaching out to us. When I reached out to uh, our existing uh, list of investors, the bulk of them were saying like, hey, if you are going to raise, we're following on. So just let us know. Um, so there's a huge appetite, I think, for 
uh, for the position that we're in. Again, I'm super grateful that we're in this position. And for that reason, we're, we're looking to ramp up our fundraising efforts, less so because of need, but more so because we're in a position where we could reach so many people around the world um, in a way that we would never have been able to have done before. Um, and we're, we're hoping that the extra investment boost can help facilitate that type of reach. That's great. Yeah, get it while you can. Where can people find out about Scoodle if, if they want to check it out? You can check out our website, scoodle.co.uk. We're on the App Store uh, and the Play Store as well. Um, you could also reach out to me directly. I love feedback. I'd love to learn. Uh, my email is ishmael at scoodle.co.uk. Um, the more of these conversations I have, the more I can learn about where the world uh, the world is. And obviously on our side, we are doing everything that we can to try and create that world that creates brands for educators. Awesome. Ishmael, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you on. Well, thanks a lot for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode at the sunny Union Street Studio in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Ishmael for joining us this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy Thompson for producing, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening.